Well, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, very grateful to have, once again, this opportunity to be with you uh, in your schools. This is our third of our four uh, Wednesday Lenten series, and uh, it's uh, a, a really a graced opportunity to uh, have the opportunity to speak with you and also to hear, uh, I hope, uh, as we continue this morning with uh, any comments or questions that that, uh, that you might have. I'm, I'm happy to say that here in the room where uh, we are at the uh, diocesan offices, we have 18, I think at last count, 18 um, uh, seniors from Lebanon Catholic who are here with us, and that always makes us a little more uh, realistic to have uh, the uh, students here in, in the room with me and not just, not just talking to a screen, or, although I can see your pictures. But, so welcome, Lebanon Catholic. It's good to have you here this morning, and I hope you'll have some, some questions as well. So last week, uh, we talked about, uh, I, I guess, the spiritual life and the fact that we are in a battle, and the battle isn't just against our own free will, uh, our own desires. It's not just against uh, things of this world, but it truly is a spiritual battle uh, against uh, forces that are truly spiritual, that are not flesh and blood. And we, we reflected a little bit on that. And then we concluded last week with the prayer to St. Michael. And I, I think everyone knows that I, I asked uh, uh, that all of our parishes begin to pray the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel um, at Masses, at whatever time they thought appropriate, before Mass, after Mass, toward the end of Mass. But to include that, to uh, invoke this special and the powerful intercession of this uh, great angelic defender. In fact, I have a, a little statue that was given to me uh, last year as a gift of St. Michael. I'll, I'll refer to that in a little bit later. But I thought this morning what we might do is to uh, reflect a little bit on the person of St. Michael the Archangel. Um, and also that prayer that I've asked that uh, be said throughout the diocese uh, at Masses. It has a fascinating history, and so does uh, Michael. So both from the biblical uh, uh, references to him, as well as his place in the history of our church and in the prayers of our church. So the, this morning's presentation, I'd like to look to the person of St. Michael, uh, the Archangel. You know, I don't know if any of you did, but he's a very popular confirmation saint name. Uh, I had confirmation Monday night at St. Catherine Labore, and I think there were three, three uh, candidates who took the name Michael the Archangel. And almost every time I celebrate confirmation, which is a lot this time of the year, uh, there's at least one or multiple people who choose Michael the Archangel as their confirmation name. Maybe some of you, anybody in the room here? Do you remember back to your confirmation? No, no one, no one here did. Well, but it, it is, he, his name is, is pretty popular. So what I thought we would do would be to look to the references to St. Michael in the Bible, in sacred scripture, uh, to just look a little bit at the whole idea of angels, because it's something we, we uh, might not consider very much. Uh, you see them on uh, cards and artwork and different places, but sometimes they're reduced to uh, look like little babies or something, and they're very powerful spiritual beings. So I'd like to reflect a little bit on the very nature of angels, since Michael is one of the angels. Um, again, to look at the history, uh, at least two instances of Michael in the history of our church, and then his place in Catholic prayers. And then finally, the, I think, fascinating story of that prayer to St. Michael the Archangel, to look at where that began. It began with Pope Leo XIII, uh, really at the end of the 19th century. And it was prayed always at the end of Mass until 1968. Uh, so we'll uh, look at that prayer and its origin. So that's my plan for our time together this morning. Let's begin uh, with a prayer, and it's gonna be a prayer to St. Michael, but not the typical one. There are many different prayers in the rich treasury of our Catholic prayers and, uh, to St. Michael, and uh, this one is, is not the typical one, but I'd like to use it to uh, begin our time together this morning. So let's pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. O glorious Prince, St. Michael, chief and commander of the heavenly hosts, guardian of souls, 
vanquisher of rebel spirits, servant in the house of the divine king, and our admirable conductor. You who shine with excellence and superhuman virtue deliver us from all evil, who turn to you with confidence and enable us by your gracious protection to serve God more and more faithfully every day. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. Well, that particular prayer, again, I said it wasn't the one that we're all familiar with, but it has certain catchphrases in it that maybe caught your attention, and I hope that they'll become clearer why, why we use those. That word prince, you generally think of an archangel as a prince, but we'll see where that comes from. Uh, vanquisher of <laughs> rebel spirits, the, the military theme of St. Michael battling against the fallen angels, uh, guardian of souls. We're going to see one of his uh, understood uh, roles is to uh, take the soul at, when we leave this world and, and present us to God for the particular judgment. Um, and we ask him to defend us uh, from all evil, huh? to, to, to deliver us from evil, a kind of an echo of what we ask God in the, uh, what Jesus taught us to pray at the end of the, the Lord's Prayer. And Michael has a role to play uh, in defending us from evil in the world. So um, let's begin, and as I said, we'll begin with um, a little look at St. Michael uh, in sacred scripture. Um, even that prayer, and if you've seen other images, and I, I just refer to my statue here that was given to me, uh, Michael is, is usually depicted as what you might call a night warrior, huh? uh, a, a soldier wearing battle armor, uh, here uh, he's carrying a sword in his right hand and he's got a, a military shield uh, in his left hand. He has a breastplate uh, on, as you might find a Roman soldier uh, wearing. So, so he's depicted in, in this uh, ready for battle kind of uniform. And uh, again, just the very artistic portrayal of St. Michael uh, tells us something about uh, his role uh, in salvation history. J just to take a look at the word Michael itself. Um, in Hebrew, that word Michael means who is like God. Who is like God. Um, when you're reading the Bible and you find a name that ends in E-L, like Michael, it usually has something to do with God, some, some, some uh, statement about God. So Samuel, Joel, Ezekiel, Raphael, Gabriel, uh, all of those uh, names um, uh, have, have uh, contained in them that E-L, which is the Hebrew word for Elohim, which is the polite word or uh, the, the right way to say God. They never spoke the divine name, Yahweh. But L, at the end of a name, designates that that name has something to do uh, with God. So Michael, Michael is who is like God. Me in Hebrew is who. Who is like God. And probably because he is the one who Satan or Lucifer thought he could be equal to God and, and battles and loses. So Michael is saying no one is like God. Right? God is unique. God is supreme. And so he defeats the fallen angels who wanted to be like God. That was also the, the temptation to our first parents, right? In the book of Genesis, in the garden, uh, oh, God doesn't want you to eat that forbidden fruit because if you do, you'll be like him. And, and so the temptation perhaps was similar to the angels. We don't know, but, but the angels had some kind of a test and uh, those angels who fell pray to the test uh, became the fallen angels or demons, devils, and the chief of them, Lucifer, we know pretty much as Satan. So the name Michael itself means who is like God. Um, and it, we find him several places. I just want to point out a couple places in the Bible where we find uh, the angel Michael referred to. And uh, in the Old Testament, the principal place is the book of Daniel. Uh, in the book of Daniel, uh, that book is set during the time of the Persian Empire, when Persia was the uh, uh, world power, 
and they had defeat. The Israelites were, were in exile, and Daniel is seen as one of those faithful Jewish uh, righteous men who's uh, in uh, exile in, in Persia. And um, there's this, in chapter 10 of the book of Daniel, there are two references to Michael. Let me just read them. But you hear where, why we address Michael as a prince in that opening prayer uh, is exactly the way he's addressed or spoken of in Daniel chapter 10. It says this, it starts out not with Michael, but the prince of the kingdom of, of uh, Persia. See, they believed that every country had its own angel, its own tutelary or, or protecting angel that took care of that nation. So kind of like a person has a guardian angel, it was understood that nations had an angel to oversee or, or to protect the whole people, the whole nation. So Daniel chapter 10, verse 13 says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, so higher than the prince of Persia, the angel of Persia, came to help me. So I left him there with the prince of the kingdom of Persia and came to make you understand what is to befall your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. Michael is often uh, uh, associated with the, the end of the world, the final battle, right? the, the, the ultimate battle before the, 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 uh, the, the return for us of, of the Messiah. So uh, in chapter 10, verse 13 and 14, um, there's that reference to the prince, the chief of the princes, um, uh, who is Michael. And then at verse 20, it said, and, and then he said, this is Daniel speaking, do you know why I have come to you, but, and I'm sorry, it, they're speaking to Daniel. Do you know why I come to you, but now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia, and when I am through with him, lo, the prince of Greece will come. That, that's the next nation to become the world power after the, the Greeks, after the Persians. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. So what's being said there in the book of Daniel is that Michael is the guardian angel of the people of Israel while they're in exile. Uh, he's your prince. And that's why we address Michael in that opening prayer as, O glorious prince, St. Michael, because of what's referred to in the book of Daniel. Um, in the book of Jude, uh, the letter to Jude, rather, the letter of Jude, um, Michael is referred to again, and it's there that the title Archangel is used. I'm just going to read the opening. But when the Archangel Michael, so the letter of St. Jude in the New Testament refers to Michael with that term Archangel. He's referred to again in the first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 4. I won't mention that, but the real dramatic mention of St. Michael in the New Testament is the final book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation. And there in chapter 12, um, is this whole idea of Michael defending uh, us in the battle. So let me read this. It's Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. Now a war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon is an image in Revelation for Satan, right? So fighting against Satan, the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they were defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and power of the king and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren uh, has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before God and they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. Rejoice then, O heaven, you that dwell therein, but woe to you on earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. So Michael and his angels uh, fought against the dragon and won the victory uh, in heaven but the sad news on that one for us is that the dragon and his angels were sent to earth and they're here among us uh, to uh, do battle uh, with us. That's what we, 
we, we read in the, uh, in the book of Revelation. So uh, those are the citations, and the most dramatic one being that uh, citation from the 12th chapter of, um, uh, Revela of the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse of St. John. In the period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's called the intertestamental period, there was a great fascination with angels, and Michael appears in a lot of writings in that time that were not included in the Old Testament. They were seen not to be really true biblical books, but nevertheless, there was a fascination. There's a lot of references uh, to Michael, uh, the prince, uh, in, in those writings that didn't make it into the scriptures. So let's take a look at the second part of this morning um, at uh, the very nature of, of angels. There's a whole branch of theology called angelology. And it's, it's not a common word, but it's self-explanatory, self I think. Huh? It's the, the theology or the study of angels. So, so who are these? Well, first of all, let me say that if you look in the catechism, there's a whole section the Catechism of the Catholic Church, beginning at 328, number 328, going to 336. You can check it out and see exactly what the church says and teaches about these purely spiritual beings, the angels, 328 to 336 in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Did you know, every time we pray the creed at Sunday Mass or at other times when we pray the creed, we say, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I don't know if you've thought about that. Those words easily come off of our lips because we memorize them. But we're saying that God is the creator of a world that is invisible. And the angels, who are pure spirits, non-bodily, non-corporeal, those angels are part of that invisible world that we profess faith in every time we say the creed. God is the maker of those things that are visible and invisible. So, first of all, angels are created. They're not eternal. They didn't always exist. But like us, God created the angels. And they are purely spiritual, personal beings. Uh, they're not just forces out there like wind and, uh, and the, the elements of nature but they're personal beings created uh, by God. They do not have bodies. There's nothing corporeal. They're purely spiritual. And they are immortal like our souls, like us. They didn't always exist, but once they come into existence, once God created them, they'll never go out of existence like us, right? We didn't always exist. You, you were born at a particular place in time, but you will never go extinct and will die in this world but our lives will continue for eternity. Right? We'll move into a timelessness that we call eternity. And we have some options of how we're gonna spend eternity, either in eternal happiness or away from God and eternal unhappiness or pain and suffering that we call hell. So the angels uh, were uh, are not eternal, they were created, but they are immortal. They don't go out of existence. Um, the angels, like us, have an intellect and a will. All right? They have a mind, and they have the, ch the power of choice. But what sets us apart from them is that because they're not material beings, their intelligence is superior to ours, and their wills, once they make a decision, are irreversible. So people would say, well, if Satan made a mistake and he chose against God, why doesn't he just repent? Why doesn't he just go to God and say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, forgive me. He can't. Once angels set their will on something, they can't change their will. See, we only know things partially because we're bodily. And so our intellect is somewhat hampered by our bodily nature. And we can change our minds. You do that all the time, right? You say, well, I think I'll have uh, scrambled eggs for breakfast. And then a minute later, you say, no, I think I'll have uh, cereal or... I'll have a piece of fruit. So we, we change our minds because we only know things very partially. But the angels who aren't limited by a physical body have a more keen or superior intellect than will. And once they decide, it's an irreversible decision. So Satan can't go back to God and say, oh, I made a mistake, I'm sorry, please forgive me. He can't change that decision. He's locked in it for all eternity, all the fallen angels. The only thing they can do is 
tempt us to join them in that decision. Right? They know that we have free will too, and if we join them in that rebellion against God, then they will win us to be with them for eternity because they can't change the mistake they've made. So they want to trip us up to make the same mistake. Fortunately, when we make our mistakes, when we sin, we can change our minds, change our decisions, and come back to God. It's something the angelic, spirit, uh, uh, angelic beings are not able to do. Now that word angel that we use um, comes from the Greek word, it's angelos, and it means a messenger. It was a common word in, in ancient Greece uh, for someone who carried a message from one person to another, or, uh, uh, you know, someone who, who, who took someone's word and carried it to other people, maybe from the king or, or just uh, daily life. You, you didn't have uh, uh, Facebook or tweeting or uh, email, so you had a messenger, and the messenger was called an angelos. So spiritual beings is, is who they are by nature, and angel is described, describes what they do, right? They're messengers, and those are the ones mainly that we meet in, in, the, in the scriptures, are <coughs> the messengers of God who carry, like Gabriel, we just had on Monday, the uh, beautiful feast of the Annunciation. So what was that about? Well, Gabriel was sent by God to a town of Nazareth to the Blessed Mother to announce to her, to carry a message that God had chosen her to be the mother of his son. So Gabriel uh, is a messenger, uh, and that's the, the, the very nature, I mean, I'm sorry, it's, it's, the, it's the purpose of angels to carry messages to us here um, uh, on, on earth from God. So their nature is a spirit, they're, what they do is they're angels, they're messengers. And that one other thing that uh, over the development of our Catholic theology uh, and looking at scripture, there are different mentions of different types of angels. And we uh, talk about the nine choirs of angels, their categories, nine different categories of angels that are probably, all of them are mentioned somewhere in the New Testament. That's an interesting word, choir. Uh, why do we call them choirs? Because Basically, most of the angels are in heaven singing the praises of God. Right? They, they are eternally speaking and singing God's glory, God's honor, God's praises. In fact, if you listen carefully to the preface of the Mass, right before we begin the great Eucharistic prayer, the priest prays this preface and starts, the Lord be with you, lift up your hearts, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It always ends with words like these, that we join our voices to the heavenly voices of the angels in heaven as they sing your praise, and so we acclaim, holy, 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 what the vision of Isaiah saw the angels saying before the throne of God. So that's probably why they're called choirs, because the angels are there before God's throne, giving him praise and glory and, and, and honor. So, so the, the types of angels, or the choirs, or the, the seraphim, and, and that means the fiery ones in Hebrew. And they are seen to be the closest to the throne of God. They're so close to God's glory that they're on fire, that they, they're, they're the burning ones, the seraphim. We get the cherubim as the, the next choir, and we get the word cherub. Sometimes we use that as a synonym, uh, right, for angels. A cherub uh, is, a, a, we, we use that uh, typically to refer to an angel sometimes. Uh, uh, and, on, and especially classical artwork, there's little, little baby-like looking, and they're, they're, they're sometimes called cherubs. And then their thrones and their dominions and virtues and powers, archangels, principalities, and then, and then angels. Um, the angels, the last choir, are the ones that are closest to us, and it's from those, that rank or that category that we have our guardian angel. Because we, you know, we're, we're taught that God loves us so much that he's, he's assigned to each one of us a protector, a, a personal guardian to be with us throughout our life's journey. And we call that our, our guardian angel. It's from the, the ninth choir, the choir of the angels. So the, the, uh, Michael, uh, a, a, as I mentioned, the, the great and glorious warrior uh, angel, uh, has been honored from very early uh, days in the church, as early as the, the uh, fourth century, the 300s. Uh, there were churches both in the east and in the West, 
name for uh, St. Michael. Um, and uh, they, they, uh, a, a church was dedicated to him on September the 29th um, in, in around the, the fourth or fifth century. And uh, that became the feast day of St. Michael, September the 29th, because that, that church was dedicated on, on that day. And uh, that was actually, the feast day was celebrated, uh, uh, I, as I said, from about the fifth century. And up until the ninth century, um, Michael was the only individual angel that had a feast day. Uh, later on, Gabriel and Raphael, the other archangels who are mentioned in the New Testament, had a feast day as well. And then in the 20th century, after the Second Vatican Council, um, Gabriel and Raphael were added to St. Michael's Day, uh, September the 29th. So today, on September the tw this year, on September the 29th, we celebrate the Feast of the Archangels, Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael. But up until um, the uh, 9th century, uh, that, that was called Michaelmas, like we have Christmas, Michaelmas was September the 29th, and it was the Mass of St. Michael, the Archangel, Michaelmas. So, uh, but just to point out how important uh, devotion to St. Michael has been uh, throughout the, um, the history of our church. I want to mention in the third part this morning, uh, two apparitions, two appearances um, that are interesting, I think, in the history of our church where Michael uh, was revealed or appeared to a group of people. Uh, in, in the year 590 in Rome, uh, there was a terrible plague and people were dying left and right from, from this plague. And the Pope at the time was a great Pope. In fact, he's called Gregory the Great and he's a saint, Saint Gregory the Great, um, uh, decided that uh, this plague uh, in order to ask God to deliver Rome from this plague, he would have a penitential procession. And so the Pope and lots of people in the city of Rome and uh, the clergy and the laity and religious formed this procession around the streets of Rome asking God to uh, deliver them from this terrible plague. And as they were coming across a bridge back toward the Vatican, in front of them was the tomb of the Emperor Hadrian. <coughs> I don't know if anyone, anybody been to Rome that's in the room here, at least, no? Well, well, this is an interesting building and it's still standing at the end of the bridge in the, in the area of the Vatican. It's a big round building and that was the tomb that Emperor Hadrian had built for himself. Well, as they're crossing the bridge, Pope St. Gregory the Great looks up and on the top of Hadrian's tomb is the appearance of St. Michael the Archangel. And Michael has his sword up in the air, but then he puts it in the sheath. And Gregory took that to be a sign that through the intercession of St. Michael, the plague would be over. And indeed it did, it did end. And so today, if you go to Rome, <clears throat> that tomb of the Emperor Hadrian is called the Castle Sant'Angelo, the Castle of the Holy Angel. And it's part of the Vatican and at the top of that, you would, if you looked at the top of what was Hadrian's tomb, now the ca castle of the Holy Angel, you see this gigantic golden statue of St. Michael. It's, it's still there to this day, commemorating that sixth century apparition, which ended a terrible plague in Rome. The second uh, interesting uh, appearance, I think, of St. Michael took place a little, even a little earlier than that, around the year 492, and then there were three, two subsequent apparitions um, in a place called uh, Mount Gargano, down in southeastern Italy, near the area where Padre Pio is from. And there's a, a place there called Mount Gargano, um, and <clears throat> uh, in, in around the year 492, St. Michael appeared uh, to someone up on this, it's a really high, high mountain and very inaccessible the roads in there now, but at one time it was very, very difficult. And there's a basilica up there, which has been a place of pilgrimage where Michael appeared for, for over the centuries. People like St. Bernard, St. Francis of Assisi, St. <coughs> Bridget of Sweden, they, they, they made pilgrimages there. Pope Benedict went there, as well as St. John Paul II went there to visit this place where St. Michael uh, was to have um, 
uh, appeared in southeastern uh, Italy. So over the centuries, there have been these reported appearances of Michael uh, to assure us that he's, he's with us and he's, he's here to, uh, to uh, defend us. So if we put all this together, uh, it's kind of developed in our church. There are, there are four responsibilities, you might say, that St. Michael uh, exercises for us. Uh, first of all, he continues to wage the battle against Satan and the other fallen angels, so he's our protector in the spiritual battle. He, he continues to save the souls of the faithful from the power of Satan, especially when we're nearing death. It's always been the idea that, of course, St. Joseph is the patron of a happy death, but also to intercede or to ask the intercession of St. Michael uh, to help uh, someone when they're nearing the end uh, of their life. Uh, the third is to protect the people of God, both the Jewish people, we believe that we, we heard that he was the, the chief prince to protect the people of God uh, in the book of Daniel. So he's the guardian of Israel, but he's also the guardian of the new Israel, the people of the new covenant, the church. Um, and, and we believe that Michael, you know, again, intercedes and is a protector for our church through history. And finally, <coughs> to lead the souls of the departed from this life and present them to the Lord for that final judgment, the particular judgment that we each face uh, before, uh, after our, our death and as we enter that across the threshold to uh, eternal life. So the fourth part this morning, I'd, I'd like to just point to three different prayers uh, where Michael has uh, been influential in the liturgy or the praying of our, of our Catholic Church. Um, the first is, um, and, and this is an older form, we, we say sometimes in the act of penitence at Mass, the act of, uh, the um, I confess, the confidior, I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned. The older form of that prayer that I grew up uh, praying um, said that I, I confess to Almighty God, to the Blessed Virgin Mary, to St. Michael the Archangel. It was kind of interesting that uh, Michael was included in the I confess in the older form. That was changed again in 1968. But until then, we confess to our, our Blessed Mother, first, and right after her, St. Michael the Archangel, and then the Apostles Peter and Paul, all the angels and saints, um, but he was included uh, in, in, in that prayer, to, again, to show the influence that St. Michael had over the centuries. Um, in the Litany of the Saints, when we call upon the Blessed Mother and all of the saints, Michael is number two. It's not, again, it's Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. So he's He's number two, and now, now it's St. Michael, Raphael, and Gabriel, uh, all, all three put together, but originally it was just St. Michael, right after our Blessed Mother. And I wanted to show you um, a, a, another area where uh, St. Michael is invoked is in the Solemn Exorcism. This is the book that's not on many people's shelves, but it's the ritual for a solemn exorcism. If someone is truly possessed, by Satan and it's judged to be a, an authentic case of possession, then there are these long prayers that are prayed uh, over the person who seems to be possessed. And uh, I, I just want to read one part of it. Uh, at, at, in the middle of the exorcism, the priest reveals the crucifix to the person and then prays this long formula of exorcism, and it begins by uh, invoking the Blessed Mother. I'll read that, and then I'll read the, the very second invocation. It says, Listen, O merciful God, to the prayers of the Blessed Virgin Mary, whose son dying on the cross crushed the head of the ancient serpent and entrusted all people to his mother to be her children. Let the light of truth shine forth in this your servant. Let the joy of peace enter him or her. Let the spirit of holiness possess him or her, and dwelling there render him or her calm and pure. Listen, O Lord, to the pleading of blessed Michael, the archangel, and of all the angels ministering to you. God of hosts, repel the force of the demon, the, of the devil. God of truth and pardon, drive away his deceitful attacks. God of freedom and grace, break the bonds of iniquity. Those are just two of the beginning prayers for a solemn exorcism, but you heard we called on the Blessed Mother, 
to intercede for the person who's possessed, and the very next invocation is Michael the Archangel to, again, do battle with the possessing spirit and drive that spirit uh, out, of, out of the person. The, the final uh, part this morning, before I, I hope we have um, a discussion, is the actual uh, prayer itself, the, the prayer that we pray uh, at, at Masses. And uh, I, I'd like to just give you a little uh, history, because I think it's kind of interesting, uh, the, the origin uh, of that prayer, which I'm sure most people don't know about, but you will this morning, and uh, you can tell others about it. But uh, we'll be praying it, but, but, but very few people really know why it was written and how it got included uh, in the prayers of the church uh, after Masses. So um, it was during the pontificate of Pope Leo XIII. Now he was Pope from uh, 1878 to 1903. So 1878 to 1903. And during his pontificate, it was the, the, there were very, very turbulent political things going on, particularly in Italy. So it was a very troubling, uh, stressful, uh, critical time uh, for, for the church. And around the year, uh, in the year 1884, the story goes that Pope Leo XIII had said a, his morning mass, so he'd finished mass, and he had a few of his advisors there that he uh, was speaking to, and all of a sudden he just fell on the floor. He just fell over in the midst of that conversation. And of course they immediately called for a doctor uh, they knew something, something was wrong. The doctor came and he had no pulse. And so they concluded that Leo XIII had died just suddenly there right in the midst of that conversation. Uh, but suddenly he started breathing again. He had a pulse and he seemed to be normal. He was able to stand up and, and talk to everyone. But what he said was this, what a horrible scene I was permitted to see. What a horrible scene I was permitted to see. He had a vision. God had given him this extraordinary experience when he was uh, out and even had no signs of life. But he had this vision about Satan's influence in the world and how it was going to continue to get worse and worse in this vision. So moved by that vision, Pope Leo XIII composed the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel. Seeing the influence uh, and the power of Satan over the world and in the world, he wrote the prayer to St. Michael uh, the Archangel. Um, and uh, in 1886, he ordered that that prayer that he wrote be prayed at the end of every Mass. Um, it was called the part of the Leonine prayer, Leo for Pope Leo. The Leonine prayers were said at the end of Mass from uh, 1886 until 1968. And 1968, after the Second Vatican Council, we had all of the liturgical reforms and the prayer to St. Michael was dropped. Uh, we, we no longer prayed it. But interestingly enough, in 1994, St. John Paul II, who was Pope, 1994, urged every Catholic to pray the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel. I don't, honestly don't remember that, but in doing my research for this talk, St. John Paul II, who was also very much aware of Satan's activity in the world, urged us all to personally, not at Mass, he didn't, he didn't say it had to be restored to Mass, but he urged every Catholic to pray the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel. So he wrote it, Leo XIII wrote it in 1884, 1886, he said that it should be prayed at the end of every Mass. And then in 1889, he wrote a much longer prayer to St. Michael the Archangel. So he must have really, obviously, was very, very, really affected by that vision. It's something he couldn't forget. So it's two pages long. I have a copy of it. I'm not going to read it. But interestingly enough, when this was written in 1889, only bishops and priests could pray it. Uh, Leo sent it out throughout the world, but only bishops and priests could pray it because it is actually a formula of exorcism. Uh, so it, it, it's, it, I'll, I will read the first paragraph because you'll hear some words in there that I hope 
will echo what I've just been saying from the scripture and the, the history of our theology of, of uh, the angels and, and, uh, and St. Michael. But this long, long prayer to St. Michael the Archangel was only uh, able to be prayed by bishops and priests because it is a formula for exorcism. So it starts out like this, O glorious Archangel St. Michael, Prince of the heavenly host, defend us in battle and in the struggle which is ours against the principalities and powers, against the rulers of this world of darkness, against the spirits of evil. And it goes on, come to the aid of men whom created immortal, God made in his own image and likeness and redeemed at great price from the tyranny of the devil. And it goes on for another page and a half, invoking the intercession of St. Michael the Archangel. So that's the interesting history, I think, of the prayer of St. Michael. But Leo XIII kind of dropped on the floor. Everybody thought he was dead for a, a few minutes. And he had this vision of the, the activity of Satan in the world. And he was so moved by it that he wrote the prayer that we know as the prayer of St. Michael the Archangel. And then he wrote that much longer one that was restricted to be prayed only by bishops and priests. Um, and then in 1994, St. John Paul II urged all of us to pray that prayer personally. So for those reasons, I, I, I wanted to, I think it, it, it's important that we continue to invoke the help of St. Michael the Archangel in our own battle, in the church's battle today. Um, and uh, so we now in our diocese and in many other dioceses, we've restored that prayer to St. Michael to uh, sometime uh, during our masses here throughout the diocese. But I, I, in reviewing all of this with you this morning, I, I, I urge you to get a copy of that prayer if you don't know it yet by heart. We will after praying it for some time, but maybe it's a fresh uh, prayer to many of you. But I would, would invite you to uh, get a copy of it, keep it with you, and when you're tempted, when you're tempted for something, to do something you know is wrong, pray, pray that prayer. Um, uh, ask St. Uh, Michael the Archangel to help you when you're in the midst of some spiritual battle uh, in, in your daily life uh, and you feel that you're, you know, you're, you're being drawn in the wrong direction. Pray the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel. Um, we need God's help and we need this powerful intercessor to help us do battle with these spiritual uh, forces. And Michael will come to our aid. It's, it's what he does. It's who he is. So with that, uh, I'd, I'd be interested if anybody has any, any questions or comments. I'd like to hear them or try to respond if you have a question. Last yeah, last week most of them were here in the room. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Where did you get the statue? Where did I get it? Uh, it was given to me as a gift actually by one of the staff here, um, I think for my birthday last year, yeah, which is in August. So. Um, it was given to me, so I, I have it in my room at my house, where, you know, where, where I live. Uh, but I thought I would bring it over as, a, as a, an image. There are lots of different images. Sometimes Michael has a soldier's helmet on, and he has full armor. Oftentimes he's shown you know, with a spear or a sword. And if there's a spear, usually there's a dragon or a serpent or some big ugly creature underneath him. And he's doing battle or killing the killing the dragon. And so it's an image of what we heard about in the, the book of Revelation, uh, Revelation chapter 12. So yeah, it was a, it was a gift to me. So I, it, it, I had to be very careful bringing it because I'm afraid I'm going to break the, the sword. It looks very delicate in that, whatever that material is. Yes, please. Um, I have a question about the fallen angels. So about what? The fallen angels. Fallen angels, uh-huh. Oh yes, I'm 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 sure I'm sure that they do regret the choice they made. There's a there's a sadness. That's why Satan uh, we always well, depict him as being evil, but he's also the saddest of creatures. You know, there's no joy in the decision that that he made and that the others have made, and that they have to live with for all eternity. I mean, our joy. Um, our happiness, we were, we were made by God for happiness, right? We, every, there's no one here, no one out there that doesn't want to be happy. 
it, we're, we're wired for happiness. Even the, the pagan Greek philosophers <coughs> knew that the human person was made to be happy. It's, our, it's the one goal that we all seek. The, the, the problem becomes in is what do we think is going to make us happy? What, what kind of choices will you make uh, in order to gain happiness? And um, Jesus came to show us the way of authentic happiness. It, it comes from love of God and love of neighbor and the service of God, the service of neighbor. When you enter into that genuinely, uh, you find ultimate happiness. And, and, and finally, we're made to be happy with God forever uh, in heaven. That, that's what he wants. He wants us to be happy. Now, the <coughs> fallen angels, Satan and the uh, fallen angels, have made a choice that excludes that eternal happiness. So I'm sure they regret it and they're sad creatures. And all they can do, as I mentioned, is to enlist us in their unhappiness. So Satan will never hold out something to you and say, here, choose this, it'll make you unhappy. <laughs> but he will say, choose this. This really is the means to get your goal of happiness. This, if, you, if you make this decision, you will be happy. But what we find out is when we make that decision, He's lied. That's why he's called the, the father of lies, right? the prince of deception. Uh, because when you choose it and you begin to live into that choice, you're not, you won't be happy, ultimately. It, it won't lead to your wholeness or your integration. It will be disintegration. And that's what he wants. He, he wants us to enter into that unhappiness that he has to live with uh, that he exists in forever. And um, so eternal joy is only possible in communion with God. It begins here and reaches its perfection in the afterlife. But it'll only reach its perfection when we choose the right things here by God's grace, uh, the, the intercession of Mary and the saints, St. Saint Michael, who want to assist us. You know, they're in heaven already, and they're not up there looking down saying, we made it, see if you can. They, they really do want us to join them in heaven. So we have all this assistance that the scripture sometimes calls the, this great cloud of witnesses are cheering us on. But we got to know they're cheering us on. We got to feel that and, and cooperate. Uh, and that's one reason why we study the lives of the saints. They, they show us examples of, of being holy, even though they lived in very different times and their life situation was so different from ours many times, but they showed us what genuine holiness looks like. And we can replicate that by God's grace in our own place, in our own time. So I, I am certain that the, yeah, the angelic spirits can't reverse a decision because their intellect and will are superior to ours. They're not hindered, um, uh, they're not hampered by a physical body or physical organs. Uh, but once they make that decision, it's, it's fully informed and irreversible. And they've got to be very sad. Uh, Bishop Gamer, we have a question over here at Lancaster Catholic. Great, hi. Great. Hi. Um, I was wondering, where do we get the, um, the history behind the angels, or how do we find out about um, the, the interactions they've had about their creation? I'm sorry, where do we get the... the interaction between angels and creation and what they do? Where, well, I mean, it, it's... The it's um, uh, uh, I think the, the primary source, of course, is, is the revelation in Scripture. Um, you, you see um, uh, Raphael, for instance, is sent as a companion in the book of Tobit. Uh, and, and so God sends him with the message of healing. Um, and, and his name means God heals. Raphael, there's another L in the name, so God is, God is in the meaning of that name. And, and then Gabriel uh, comes, from, uh, comes to the Blessed Mother and reveals, to, makes the announcement that she's going to be the mother of God. So the interaction between angels and, and humans are, is very clear in the scriptures. Um, you know, God uses them as his agents to send messages uh, to us. Um, the, the Old Testament is, is, is kind of interesting. We, we just had on Sunday, if you remember, the, uh, the reading from Exodus chapter 3 about the burning bush um, and uh, 
uh, Moses is tending his father-in-law's sheep and he sees the, 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 uh, the bush filled with flames, but the bush isn't the fuel for them, it's not burning up. They're just, so this is a supernatural kind of fire, it's not natural at all. And God speaks to Moses, but it says the angel of the Lord at first is there, but then it's clear that it's God. So uh, in the Old Testament, there's a very, very close connection between the very person of God and the angels that he, he sends. The, the story of Abraham entertaining the three strangers um, is, is a beautiful story of, of the hospitality uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the, the Mideast. Um, but what Abraham and Sarah don't know is that they're really entertaining, uh, they're entertaining angels, they're really offering hospitality to God. And, and that story, uh, there's a beautiful icon by Andrei Rublev, who's a great iconographer and uh, a Russian mystic and uh, uh, monk. Uh, and, and it's the three uh, uh, guests, um, and, and it's, it's a representation of the Trinity. Um, so uh, there's a close association between the angels and God. And uh, sometimes it's very clear that God is sending one of these spiritual beings. Other times, it, there's a mix-up that, that God is with that spiritual being. That just it depends on what part of the Old Testament we're reading. But in the New Testament, God sends like Gabriel. Uh, God uh, uses Saint Michael to engage in that spiritual battle uh, to represent the forces of good against the kingdom of Satan. They bounced out, Bishop, so if you didn't hear the rest of your... What's that? They're having technology problems. Where? A Lancaster Catholic, so oh. he didn't hear the rest of your answers, but everybody oh, else did. sorry. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Um, another question about fallen angels. If angels are as smart and intellectual as us, meaning probably even smarter than us... Yeah, they are. Why... Well, I, I think the, it's, it's the same as our first parents. Probably, it's pride. You know that it, it's said that Lucifer, whom we identify with Satan, that that name, uh, it 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 means the light bearer. Lux lucis is the word for light, and ferro fairy tuli latos is the, the Latin word for to carry or to bear something. So the very name Lucifer means one who carries the light. And it was understood that he was one of the, the, the brightest, you know, one, one of the chief angels. So what would it be about someone who had all this giftedness from God that would cause you to, it's, it was pride. Yeah. I'm so good that I can make this, I, I, I will make this decision. I can, I, can, I can be like God. And that's why Michael's question is, who is like God? No one is. God is unique, supreme being. But the fallen angels, I, 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 I think it is they're very intelligent. You know, sometimes people who are very gifted intellectually think that they created themselves. <laughs> you know? And they believe science is the only source of knowledge. And unless I can prove it and understand it, it doesn't exist. So, uh, so you take that to another level of the spiritual beings who have intellect superior to ours, and then I guess there are grades even within their superior intellect. So Lucifer must have had one of the most lucid, gifted minds. And he became prey to his own pride, I think. And, and, and that, that can happen to every one of us. That's why one of the chief virtues to grow in the spiritual life is humility. You know? And that doesn't mean putting yourself down or thinking uh, less of yourself. As C.S. Lewis said, humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less, you know, thinking of God and others, and then yourself. You don't, you're not, you, know, you don't deny your giftedness and your uniqueness, and that, that's not real humility. Uh, humility is honesty, but it's also to recognize my place, and I'm, I'm a creature. I'm a creature. I'm not the creator. And, and yet a lot of people think that we, we can make up the rules or change the rules, um, and, and we're really here to live by. God's rules, and it's only then that we're we're really in harmony with who we are and and, and, and with the will of God and creation itself. Does that make sense? 
One question I'm often asked is, did I ever do a solemn exorcism? This is a very new book, um, but did I ever do an exorcism? The answer, I, did I ever do an exorcism? I've done many. Uh, but there are simple exorcisms and there are solemn exorcisms. Simple, uh, simple exorcism. We were all exercised at baptism. There's a prayer over the baby or the adult uh, to drive out uh, any uh, spirits, uh, and that's called a simple uh, exorcism. So I've, I've done that a lot. When we make holy water, we bless holy water, that's a prayer of exorcism to make this creature of God, water, holy. Uh, so it's an exorcism. So there are many kinds of exorcisms. The solemn exorcism to uh, drive out a, a devil or multiple devils who seem to be possessing a person, I have never done. But as bishop, I'm the only one who can authorize a priest to do it. Um, so some, sometimes I get that question a lot. Did I ever do a, an exorcism? I've never done one, and I do not want to do one. <laughs> But I do have a priest who's very skilled and uh, holy, and uh, uh, he is our exorcist in the diocese. And he's unfortunately busy. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Sorry. Why doesn't Lucifer's name end in L, like Michael or Gabriel? I, I, who? Why doesn't Lucifer's name? What is the? Uh, why doesn't the dean? Oh well, I, I would say because it's it's he's not of God any longer. Yeah, not not every biblical name, you know, obviously, and, but but those biblical names that do end in el have whatever their meaning might be. It has God in the in somewhere in the meaning, you know. Um, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of another example, but anyhow, yeah. so, but El at the end of the name is for Elohim, which is a Hebrew polite way of referring to God. So. Yes, sir. Um, earlier, you mentioned about angels and dragons. What exactly do you mean as dragons? I thought they were like a mythical. I, 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 I presume they are. I guess there are certain types of lizards that are typed called dragons, I guess. But, but um, um, it, it, the book of Revelation is a very complex book uh, with a rather simple meaning. It, 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 the simple meaning is that God has already won the victory. So no matter what kind of problems we're facing, uh, what, whatever horrible situation we might be in, there's always reason for hope. Ne never lose hope because Christ has already conquered. That's the, that's the basic meaning of Revelation. But in itself, it's first of all a very special type of writing called apocalyptic. <coughs> apocalyptic is the Greek word for revelatio, and you can get the word better out of revelation. It's veil, revelation. The revelation is pulling back the veil, opening the veil like a stage the, the, the curtain goes back and there's the scene or the beginning of the play or the movie, whatever, but the curtain. So, so Revelation wanted to pull back, the, the, open the curtain to let us see the final victory because the, the Christians were suffering greatly in the Roman persecutions when St. John wrote the book of Revelation. So there's a lot of figurative uh, images in Revelation. And the dragon is a, an image for Satan, right? for, for the devil. Um, yeah, but there's a lot, there are all kind of creatures that almost you, you really can't even imagine uh, creatures with, uh, you know, nine eyes and nine horns and nine heads and each, horn, each head has nine horns and they're, they're very, uh, but th the idea was to, it, it, it's almost like underground literature that if a, if a Roman soldier or Roman uh, government official were to read this, they'd say, what in the world is this? This makes no sense whatsoever, throw it, you know. But to a, a, a Christian who had a Jewish background, the imagery would be very much like the book of Daniel and other parts of the Old Testament, and they would probably be able to see the meaning of it. But for someone who wasn't from a Jewish Christian background, it wouldn't make any sense at all. It would just seem like gibberish or you know, just crazy fictional writing. But what it really was was 
an underground type of, <coughs> inspired by the Holy Spirit, to assure the Christians that even though they were suffering terribly under the Roman persecutions, that Christ had already assured them victory, and in the end they will win. So, it, so the the dragon is just one of the many images in the Book of Revelation, but it's clear that it it means Satan. Are we about done? Yeah, we're done. All righty. Well, th thanks once again. We uh, uh, look forward to our final session next week. And that, that session has been the last number of years uh, talking about ways of keeping your faith in college or whatever is next in your life beyond high school as you graduate to uh, continue uh, the faithful practice of your Catholic faith. So we'll, we'll uh, look at that next week. So to conclude, uh, if, you, if you know the prayer, uh, please join along in praying it, but we'll, we'll use the, the regular prayer to St. Michael the Archangel. Once again, I thank everybody for uh, being together this morning, and uh, I, I, uh, I'm grateful for this opportunity and look forward to uh, next Wednesday. So in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. St. Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and the snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly hosts, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great day, everyone. God bless.